Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Blitz Growth. Super excited to have you guys all listening in. Uh, we have a treat for you today. Uh, Jeff, amazing person and outstanding background. Uh, he specializes in making great content. He's a five times best selling author, course creator, podcaster, and all round creator economy expert. Tongue twister there. Today, we're really excited to dive into and learn how he makes better content than everybody else how he makes writing interesting and more engaging. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm excited to dive in. Hi, Jack. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So first off, I love asking all guests this. What is your kind of elevator pitch? If you are you know, talking to someone at a bar, a friend, a barbecue, how do you kind of wrap up what you do and the value you deliver to people in kind of like one to two sentences? Um... I hate elevator pitches. Um, <laughs> I I tell people that I'm a writer, and and they go, "Oh, what do you write about?" Um, and and if I'm you know really pressed, I'll, I'll say something like, um, uh, "I um, you know as a writer, I've got two things. I write my own books, and then I run a an, uh, a writing and editing agency." And so, you know, the, the pitch for that is, is basically we work with thought leaders to help them turn their best ideas, uh, into bestsellers or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, but, but, um, uh, what I would say, and I've already violated the two sentence norm, uh, but all I'm really like, it just really depends on the context. You know, if people go, what do you do? Um, I like what Michael Port says about that in his, uh, um, in his book, book yourself solid. Gosh, I, I almost forgot that title. It's, it's old. Uh, but basically he says, you know, people don't want to know what, what you do. They want to have something interesting to talk about and, yeah. and they really want to know, is it for me? Is it, or is it for somebody else that I know, you know? And so depending on who I'm talking to, I might go, you know, uh, I'm a ghostwriter, and they would go, "What does that mean?" I would go, "Well, um, you know, you know how if you were like gonna build a house, uh, you you wouldn't try to build it yourself. Like you'd get a team of people, but you might have a vision of what you want your house to look like. But you'd get a team of people to do this because you've never built a house. You don't want to learn how to build a house. You don't want to be an architect. You want to do that. So what we do is we bring the team of people together to create a book for you that's exactly like what you would want it to be." Uh, so, you know, it just depends, but in general, I want to help people who have great ideas, turn those ideas into books worth reading because most people who want to write a book, um, just start writing instead of, instead of thinking, if you want to write a book, don't start writing, start thinking, think better if you want a better book. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've, we've interviewed a few people who specialize in, you know, creating books and that is their form and that's their outlet of, you know, creativity and what that's what they put out there is their work. Um, and, you know, it does take a lot of time to actually plan out the book. The writing isn't necessarily the hard part. Previous authors that we've uh, talked with, it's really just like planning it out to make it interesting. Um, yeah. And how do you make, you know, 200 pages? Right engaging enough to finish. Um, so, but starting out, how did you get into writing? What was your kind of progression and steps? Like, you know, we have a lot of early listeners who are maybe just coming out of college or maybe they've just, uh, you know, they're wondering what they want to do and they have a passion for writing. How did you kind of get into this path of being a five-time bestseller? I mean, how I did it was I ran away from it for a decade, you know, and, and there is something about being creative that no matter how hard you try to avoid it, you can't, you know, when I was in, uh, when I was in college, writing was an escape for me. I wasn't an English major. I was a Spanish major and, um, and I did that so that I could go to Spain for a semester. Um, and I remember feeling stressed in college. Uh, in the middle of the night or something, you know, like le like 11, 12 o'clock at night or something, I'd um, I'd sneak off, you know, especially during finals time or something, I'd sneak off to the computer lab and I would just write. Um, I would actually, we didn't have Dropbox or anything. I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> decades ago. Uh, Don't give it, it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight, <laughs> 18 years ago, maybe. Um, but um, 
I would write whatever, an, an idea, an article, maybe a story, and I would email it to myself because we didn't have a cloud. There was no clouds. Um, but I would do that. I would like if, to de-stress, I would go to a computer lab and I would write. Um, and it was my escape. It was the thing that I kept returning to. And so a decade later, you know, after I graduated college, I ended up touring the country with a band for a little while. Don't ask, don't ask me what band. Cause you know, it's not, you know, like you, you never heard of it. Um, what sort of music? Yeah. Uh, no, it was, um, it was a Christian band is what it was. Uh, okay. and we toured all over the world. Um, wow. which, which means we were in Canada, the U S in Taiwan. All over the world. Um, yeah. And we were huge in Taiwan. It was super fun. Um, no, but I mean, I just was always interested in creative things. And I, I was touring with a band, you know, and I got really good at playing guitar. And and we, we got pretty good. And it was fun. And yet, my favorite aspect of touring with a professional band was writing a weekly blog post about what we did. And so it was just this thing that kind of kept coming back to me. Um, and then when I... I, I moved on from the band and got my first real job out of college. I worked for a nonprofit and became a marketing director, which I knew nothing about, but I learned, you know, if you're, if you're a writer, you, you, you are a marketer. You can basically take those skills and easily apply them to, to building a brand. And as I did that, I realized, Oh, I want to do this for myself. And so I took this constant tugging that I had to write, um, and a, and then connected it to this skill of marketing that I kind of learned accidentally and then started a blog. And this is in 2010 probably, and just started writing about the stuff that mattered to me and built an audience and, uh, did that pretty quickly. Actually, I spent, I spent nine years trying to do that and sucking at it. And then the last time, this was my 10th blog in about a decade and it took, it took off and I'm happy to go into that if you want, but I mean, that that was it, you know, I, um, cause what was the difference between that last blog compared to the previous nine? Like, why did that one work? I stopped trying to be other people and started trying to be myself, which was a process. You know, you become yourself, you find your voice by trying on other people's voices. Um, I would, I would say that, and I didn't quit the one thing that all of those failed blogs had in common was I quit them. And this one, I said, you know what? I'm not going to quit this. Uh, I, I did an experiment with myself. I said, I'm going to write on this blog every single day for two years. And if I don't get more than 250 readers, 250, 250 readers, I'll quit after two years. So it wasn't like I was going to do it forever, but I was going to bring some serious A game in a way that I had never done that before. And when I started taking myself more seriously, other people did too. And within about 18 months, I had generated a six figure income. I quit my job and went wow. from full the blog. Time. From the blog, yeah. Wow, congrats. Yeah. yeah, it's a wild journey. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I know a lot of writers start blogging. And yeah. as you know, there's, I think there's more blogs than people in this world now at this point. <laughs> but right, um, for sure. I mean, I, yeah, make, I've got about 12 out there. I've got about a dozen just hanging out there with my name on it. So that makes sense. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Um, okay. So, and then, you know, if you're a writer and you're starting out and you said the most important thing is to write about, you know, be yourself and write about things you're interested in. How did you figure out what you wanted to write or what your niche was or what your topic was? Because I assume the blog was a specific niche because usually blogging, you kind of have to start by niching down. Yeah. I mean, so what I was, was that niche and how did you find it? I was writing about writing, you know, as, uh, as recursive as that is, as circular as it is. I was <laughs> talking about, you know, what I was learning as a writer. And really, it was about writing and marketing. And what I, at the time, I was reading writing blog because I wanted to be a better writer. And I noticed that they talked a lot about um, the craft of writing, like how to be a, you know, like how to write better. And then I read a lot of marketing blogs because I wanted to learn because I was a marketer and I wanted to grow my audience and I didn't necessarily know how to do that. And I realized you had sort of these two things that were happening on the internet. I mean, this is over a decade ago where you had kind of this like online marketing space where people are talking, blogging about blogging, talking about online marketing. And then you had kind of like, um, artists, you know, uh, people that are just talking about the craft, but, but these, these audiences weren't talking to each other. And so I, I did kind of the, you know, Steve Jobs thing, you know, where you take two seemingly disparate concepts and you combine them, 
right? So Apple is the story of uh, taking, you know, engineers and artists and getting them to work together. You know, that's that's how we get these incredible products, beautiful things that work that had never really been mm -hmm. done that way before, not to that scale. Hard to do. Yeah, Hard yeah. Do. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm a writer and I and I want an audience and I want to do good work. And, and there was a niche for people that wanted to do good work. And there was a niche for people that wanted to build an audience and I wanted to do both. And I started talking about those things to those people. And so I was sharing what I was learning as a writer, uh, but also as somebody who was trying to build a platform and, you know, make good art, but also make it matter to other people. So that's, that's what I was doing. And I try to answer your question. I tried lots of different things. I was like, oh, I, I didn't know. I was like, I'm going to write about leadership. I'm going to write about marketing. I'm going to write about business. I'm going to tell stories. And what emerged was kind of this blend of all of these different influences that made me into the writer that I am. And, um, and I tried a lot of different things and I found that me talking about my journey of evolution as a writer was, was a, was a story that people were interested in. And I was just sharing what I was learning as I was learning it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the biggest challenges for any content creator is, you know, how do they make it their full-time gig? How do they start generating revenue? You said you were pretty quickly up to six plus figures on this blog. What was the, the first dollar is always the best. How did you make your first few dollars from that blog? I tried to sell ad spots and I could never figure that out. Even when I was getting like a good amount of traffic, like over a hundred thousand unique visitors a, a month. And I don't think we, we, I don't think we measure unique visitors anymore, but whatever. Um, and, um, that didn't work for me. Not very well. Uh, the, the first thing that I sold was a product and yeah, I got, um, Basically, I spent six months and never got more than about 60 subscribers. And so this was, you know, a 25% into my two-year experiment. And I was like, oh, man, this isn't working. And then I um, I created a lead magnet. You know, this was – I was this, like, creative, snobby writer. Like, I don't, I don't want a lead magnet. That's stupid, you know. And I created this little ebook called The Writer's Manifesto. And in a week, I went from about 60 subscribers, maybe 70 subscribers, to over 1,000 because of how I, I launched a free ebook that people could download on my website. And then I was like, oh, I've got 1,000 subscribers. I bet I could do something with this. And, and then I started guest posting and um, just getting on other people's platforms. And that email list grew to about, about 10,000 people. And I wasn't making any money off of it. And it was, it was starting to cost me quite a bit of money. I don't know, maybe $100 a month with MailChimp or something. And um, uh, and I went to a conference and I told I, – I, I knew this internet entrepreneur, uh, this woman named Carrie Wilkerson. And I asked Carrie, I said, um, how do I make money off? How do I monetize this? Like where is the switch on my blog that goes from like, you know, nothing to dollar signs, right? And she says, oh, you've got a six-figure business. I was like, no, no, I think I have like a two-figure business. I think I made like 50 bucks on this. And this is about a year into it at this point. And she basically said, do a survey, find out what people want, ask them what they'd be willing to pay you for, go make it and sell it to them. And I did just that. And I created a short uh, PDF, as best, about maybe 10,000 words. I actually was two different. I wrote two different little books, two little 10,000 word books based off of some articles that I'd written. And I, and I combined it into this product package that I sold on eJunkie, uh, which is this old e-commerce site. I think it is too. And, um, I, um, I made a, a like $3,000 in a week doing that. And at the time working for a nonprofit, that was my monthly salary. And I made what I make in a month. I made it in like two days. And then and, and then the money just kept coming in. And I was like, oh. And I just kept doing versions of that. I'm happy to talk about how that expanded. Um, but like I remember lying in bed at night seeing – I was like, oh, I just made $100 this hour. I've never – never in my life have I made $100 an hour. You know, I couldn't – it was incredible. Um, I, I made at my job that year, I made about $37,000 was my salary. And I felt like that was a good salary. 
And in the next six months, um, I made about $150,000 off of this little internet business. Well, it's that audience, isn't it? And I think, you know, you nailed it when I think the main, main learnings here is, you know, don't quit, find your voice, build that email list, because it sounds like that email list is really the key. Of course. Um, and you know, creating those essentially free value in exchange for an email or now even a phone number, Mm -hmm. um, is kind of what builds that audience for you to then sell something to. And when you think about it, if you have 10,000 followers, you know, you don't need a very high conversion rate to make a decent amount of money from that. Right. Um, you know, even if 1% purchases, you know, right. you're still going to make a little bit of money to get started. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest challenges for content creators now, you know, writers, and I know it's now gone into kind of like influencers and video and image and that sort of stuff. But sure. going back to the core content of writing, you know, one of the hardest things is to get paid to write. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, there's so much free content out there. Right. It's like, how do you start generating revenue for doing this? And so that you can do it more. Yeah. Um, So, you know, that's an incredible story on how you got started. Mm -hmm. And then the next big question I see, or the next big question I want to ask you is, so you did this a while ago. Um, If you were doing this again now, would you follow the same path or would you somehow adjust what your strategy was in terms of making writing and your blog your your full time, uh, I suppose income, sure, or your main income source. Yeah, I mean, um, so just to backtrack for a minute, what I think worked was um, I didn't quit, but I also adapted strategies. Right, like I was like, I'm just gonna write, right, and that didn't really work. And I realized if I'm just writing on my little blog that nobody's reading, I can do that until I'm blue in the face, but nobody's going to pay attention to it. I've got to, one, give them a reason to pay attention. So I have to give them something before I ask something of them. So that was the free lead magnet. And then two, I need to go where other people are. And so I started pretty aggressively guest posting. I wrote, um, I wrote, I, I realized I wrote an article every day in 2012, I think it was. I wrote an article every single day on my blog. And then I guess posted on at least a hundred other blogs. And so I wrote like 400 some, you know, 450 articles that year or something like that. And so it was getting in a lot of places kind of all at once. And, and, you know, I was publishing an article or two on other people's platforms and getting, getting the link back to it. Um, so it was like, I would say it was three things. It was one, um, kind of being like being willing to find a way, being determined and not giving up at the first sign of, of um, uh, discouragement and then pivoting when you go, oh, maybe I'll try this, like trying different things instead of going, I want to get paid to write to sort of working with other people who had larger audiences than I did, getting access to their audiences and growing my audience through them. Uh, and then I think the third thing was um, – like not assuming that I knew what people wanted or needed from me. And so I wasn't like, you need to pay me to write. I was like, what do you want? Oh, you want to learn about this? Okay. I'll, I'll share that with you and I'll do it in a form that I, you know, like I'll write it. Like, it'll be fun for me to do that. Um, and I think that is the hardest part for a creative person about entrepreneurship is what you do doesn't necessarily matter to other people. You have to make it matter. You have to find a way to offer value to somebody else in an exchange where you get to do what you want and they get to get what they want. And that's always a little bit of a dance. Um, So those are sort of the principles, right? Like don't quit, um, find where other people are hanging out and then bring them back to your place and uh, find out what people want from you and give it to them. And then eventually it's just a matter of time before they give you money. So what, what I would do differently today is I'd probably swap blogging for podcasting. I would, um, I would sh- like, I don't, I don't write many guest articles for blogs anymore. Um, cause it sort of works. It's good to get the link, but you know, podcasts are where a lot of people are at. Um, and so I would just, you know, I would, I would start a podcast and I would write articles around the podcast. This is what I'm doing right now. I I write an article and then I turn it into a podcast and then, you know, um, a few times a week I I go on other people's podcasts and that's just me showing up in, in different places, um, where, when, 
what I'm sharing resonates with somebody else, they can find my stuff and that's how it works. My, my job is just show up in as many places as I can and let the people who are interested in me and what I'm creating, you know, come, come hang out if they want. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's kind of like replicating that strategy just with a different medium. So totally. you yeah, know, you can do this strategy across writing, oh, yeah. video, totally. audio, any of the different types of content that you're creating, you can kind of replicate this, uh, uh, this strategy. The other thing is I think partnerships are becoming much, much more yep. important. Like as you were saying, guest writing and all of that sort of stuff, yep. you know, it's super important for getting discovered because discovery is tough when there's so many people in this world all trying to create content. And I know we briefly spoke earlier about the value or the trade-off between quantity or quality. Mm -hmm. So you wrote a lot of content that year. And yeah. then what's your sort of advice now in balancing that content and quality? Well, quality always trumps quantity. The problem is it takes quantity to get to quality. Like you've got to put the time in, you've got to get good in the, and before you can work smarter, you do have to work harder. How can you be smarter at something that you've not done, right? Or, or not or not done that much. So if you want your full-time vocation to be writing or making videos or whatever, like make a lot of stuff, understanding that most of it is something we won't care about, right? Um, but then you start, you start to kind of find a groove and you go, oh, this is this is what I do, and and this is how I do it in a way that connects with other people and there's some resonance um so yeah like i so you have to make a lot of stuff but be careful that you don't get caught up in the hamster wheel of just making stuff this is a thing that i see uh in i don't know the world of internet marketing that concerns me which is you are not you are not trying to get eyeballs you are trying to get people who care Right. And, and you want to be careful that you're not just chasing the next set of eyeballs. I, I never want to chase tactics. I want to focus on principles. And what that means is I want to do the stuff that has always worked, borrowing somebody else's audience, uh, which is a term that my friend Brian Harris uses, you know, borrow other people's audiences to grow yours faster. I mean, Justin Bieber did that, right? That's not a new thing. Um, you could argue that this is what the artists in the Renaissance were doing when they were earning patrons who were introducing them to all of their friends. When Ernest Hemingway, you know, started uh, writing and moved to Paris in the 1920s, he became quick friends with Gertrude Stein, who introduced him to all of these people that helped him meet the people in the publishing industry that allowed him to become one of the most famous authors of the 20th century. So that's a principle. That's a strategy that has worked for a long time. The tactics change, the strategies don't, or the, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, the tactics change often, the strategies change sometimes, the principles don't. So you want to make good stuff. People are looking for good stuff. But it's going to take a lot of work to figure out what your good stuff looks like. But once you find it, it's okay to chill. I don't write an article every day anymore. Mm. I'm trying to say more with less now. Yeah. No, I think you're right, though. You need to become the expert first. And then you can start figuring out, you know, how you maximize your output from your input. But, yeah, it's super interesting because, you know, throughout time, 100% it's been collaborations. Because when you think about every of so many music artists that have come up, they've always been featured in someone else's songs or whatever. Oh, totally. And, you yeah. know, that's where they get started. So or they're if you an are opening, listening. Yeah. They're or, mm. an opening act for another band, right? You know, yep. they're, you all, you always start at, out as nobody and you're always nobody to somebody. The question mm. is, how do you find the few people who are going to care about you? Like that you're trying to find the most efficient way to get in front of the people that your work is for. And it's not for everyone. So don't try mm -hmm. to build an audience, find one, find the people out there that are waiting for your work. Cause that, cause it's a big world, you know, um, mm -hmm. there's what 8 billion people now. My mom used to say you're one in a million. That sounds really nice. <laughs> but if there's 8 billion people in the world, that means mathematically, I mean, I don't know as a math major or anything, but there are 8,000 people in the world just like you. 
And I think yeah. that's true. There's, there is a, a little army of people that are waiting for you to say the thing that you need to say the way that you are meant to say it. Your job is to find them and they're hiding in little pockets of the world and you just got to go, you got to go find them. You got to mm. get out there. Yeah. And yeah, you know, the, you bring them in by being a follower on email, uh, subscriber pretty much. And that's how you start building that, tr that little tribe. Um, okay. So quick question. So you've, kind of established the principles as being the core thing of success time and time or century over century. Are there any brands or people that you see today that you're just like, these guys are just nailing it. Um, they're doing such a good job at following the principles, delivering good content or delivering good writing. And you can see that it's successful and it's growing and they're generating a lot of revenue from that. Um, anybody who you would look out like advise people to go check out to be like, Hey, these guys are doing it well, go and learn from them. Yeah. I mean, no, the, the answer to that is no. Cause I, I, well, no, I don't follow them. I think a lot of so-called content mark, like content marketers. I don't want to be mean here. Content marketers don't produce great content. Well, uh, m marketers don't necessarily produce great content. Great creators produce great content. I don't even like the word content. If it's writing, it's writing. If it's video, it's video. Call it what it is. Pablo Picasso wasn't making content, you know? Um, uh, uh, Annie Dillard doesn't write content, you know? She writes beautiful books. Um, a person that I look up to um, is a, a poet named David White. Now, this is a very successful man who has taken his poetry and he's brought it to corporate audiences and to the mainstream in a way where he doesn't have to compromise his art. And I I watch him. I pay attention to him. He's really interesting. He, he's got a number of – he doesn't just sell poetry. He takes um, poems that he writes – and he he does like kind of the version like our version of like a webinar or something where people pay to listen to him literally read a poem and talk about it for 90 minutes. Every month he does this. Uh Boeing hired him to come in for I don't know, their 50th anniversary or something. They commissioned a poem for him, I'm talking about tens of thousands of dollars for a poem. So I am inspired by the people who are artists that aren't starving and have found a way to be uncompromising in their art, but bring it to the world in a way that uh, allows them to get what they're worth. Um, so I, I pay attention to him. I'm watching people who are doing things um, differently because the best you know, content marketers are not marketers at all. They're people that have really honed their craft. They're more interested in mastery than the multitudes. And, and because of that, we're like, wow, that's really interesting, you know? So I look at somebody like a David White or even like um, oh, Jack White, you know, the musician. It's like these people, they, un they intuitively understand marketing, but they see marketing not as the end-all be-all, which is where I think a lot of content marketers go – yeah, they, they go a little too – I did it for a long time. They go a little sideways and they go, I'm going to focus on the marketing, the marketing, the marketing. Maybe the best thing for you to do is disappear for two years and get really, really good at this thing and then come back and, yes, understand the means. Like how am I going to get this in front of people? But I think the future belongs to artists. It belongs to truly creative people who aren't memorizing the next tactic in internet marketing they're making what they create much, much better. And I, I think those of us who see that, we hear it, we experience it, it's a breath of fresh air in a world where everybody's trying to be a marketer. We don't need more marketers. We need better artists. Yeah. And that opens up the discussion to the creator economy. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that word's been thrown around more and more. Sure. And it is really trying to focus, I think, on the artist side of things versus the marketing side of things. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your your best explanation of the creator economy? Like, what's your definition of it? So for people listening who aren't sort of too familiar with that concept, and I can give some examples after this as well, sure, but what's your sure. perception of the, of the creator economy? 
Yeah, right. So if I was like, I don't know, at the bank or something, and you know, the teller's like, "What's the creator economy?" I'd be like, "Oh, you know, like people who like blog and podcast and have newsletters and and you know, YouTube and Instagram. Those people do stuff and they make money off of the things that they make. You know, that's what I would say. Um, I, I think you know, philosophically, the creator economy is emerging because the creator economy will soon be the economy. That, the, that in many ways, the future belongs to the people who make things. And that's always been true, but it's becoming more mainstream now, meaning it was only a matter of time before um, things went from, who's the guy who owns the factory? He's the guy in charge to the person making the thing. But, you know, the person in the assembly line, you know, in the early 20th century um, wasn't anything. They were a cog in the system. But now technology has made it possible for me to own my own factory. It's a computer. Like I literally have a, a way to make anything that I want and immediately share it with the world. So I don't need a factory. I don't need a boss. Uh, I don't even need channels of distribution. I have it all. So the people who make things now have direct access to the people who want those things. Uh, and so we are like just in like version – you know, 1.0 or, you know, 0.1 or something like super early on and what's going to happen in the future with the people who make things and connect them with the world. Uh, but right now the creator economy means, um, artists, makers, uh, you know, creative people who want to, uh, make things and share them on the internet and, and they're building audiences and businesses around that attention. Yeah, well, the shift kind of happened that all of those artists and creators were getting commissioned by brands and then it was getting released by brands, whereas yeah. now it's kind of direct to consumer. That's right. That's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't need a boss. You don't need a factory. You don't need, I don't know, some big shot saying, I will give you exposure. You can create your own exposure now quite easily. And 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 as we mentioned before, like, you've got a bunch of these artists now helping each other. Um they have created their own economy. They've created their own little um, uh, system where enough people are paying attention to enough individuals that they can kind of share the wealth as it were and, and help one another. And it, like that, that's how economies grow is, is they just, it just keeps growing. It doesn't, you're not just sharing limited resources with each other because you're bringing more attention to the thing. The whole thing becomes much larger. And, and I do think that, um, you know, we're talking about web 3.0 now next 30 or so years. Um, there aren't going to be jobs. Um, you know, that there, there are going to be fewer and fewer people who just do one thing for somebody else. And if you want, you will have the opportunity to make whatever it is that you make, share it with the world and, and you'll be in charge if you want. And if you don't want to do that, um, you will likely get left behind or are relegated to a certain part of society that's behind the curve. Mm, interesting. And so, you know, most of the people you work with, I think it's probably they're generating their revenue from books and those sorts of things. Those artists and creators are doing it that way. What's your take on these new types of monetization for artists like paid memberships, paid newsletters, paid groups, all this sort of stuff. Are you kind of thinking about that as a new way to, you know, deliver something to the audience or are you still kind of, you know, focused on the book side of things and like publishing once and then distributing a lot versus a lot of those other channels are like, you got to constantly be creating content. Yeah. I don't like it. I, I think it's, I think it's a, um, if we go back to what always works, um, uh, you know, a membership, is fine. A club is fine. Uh, certainly the, you know, there have always been people willing to pay, um, significant sums of money to be a part of a group of people. Um, I agree with what Stuart brand said back in the sixties or seventies information wants to be free. So if your game is, um, to sell information, good luck, right? Uh, music, books, videos, all these things are practically free now or very, very cheap and only getting cheaper because technology makes information, um, you know, easy, easy to move around. Uh, what has 
always been true is people will pay money for services and products. Um, and I, I think the, the maturity of the creator economy, and I'm just pontificating here, I don't know, but I think the maturity of it will be moving into products. So uh, I don't think, I, I think books are stronger than they've ever been. Now there's more books being published. The competition is higher. A book is not a, is not an, a book. Yeah, completely. Uh, a book is not information. A book is a product. And we have emotional experiences with products, right? Um, they're not just, um, a, a, a product is just not just a, a means of, of, I don't know, rendering a service, filling a need. Uh, obviously, I mean, we, like in, in many ways, we, we saw this was true with, with, you know, Apple going from being almost a company that was dead to becoming eventually the largest company in the world. And it was because they paid attention to the aesthetics because they wanted to create uh, products that that people had an emotional relationship with, right? Uh, I mean, this is my wallet. Um, it's an okay wallet, uh, but it has my initials on it, right? I mean, it's um, it's something personal, right? And so um, you need a market. You need a market to sell somebody something, but the real long play, if you're a creator, is to find a way to create stuff. Uh, and services work too, but find a way to create stuff that people will always want, and that and that you can make your own. You can make it into your own unique, interesting thing. The problem with the creator economy right now is creators are trying to be brands, and that is a bad idea. You are not a brand. You need to create a brand that produces goods and services that people want. Or you can do what artists have always done and go, here are my services for the world. Who wants to hire me? Who wants to you know, uh, commission me to do something? That's fine. But this whole idea that you're going to create your own little club and people are going to pay you money for your stuff, I think it's fine. It's going to work for a while and it's going to die out um, or get you know super niched down. Um, it's it's fine. It's not, um, it's not the best way to make stuff. Um, the best way to make stuff, meaning um, it's not the best way to get paid for the stuff that you're making. Find something, a product that you can create. And it doesn't have to be physical. I mean, a book is a product. Um, an event is a product, but find something that you believe in that you could spend a good chunk of your life or the next few years obsessing over. Cause that's, I mean, that is what fuels creators is I got to make something amazing. Be careful that you don't get bogged down with this whole, you know, nonsense about managing an audience. It's, um, it exists to help you do your work and share it with people. But we all, we tend to get stuck in these, I don't know, cycles of um, just talking to people about how to be what you are. That's not ultimately that interesting. Um, and you've got, you've got to do what you do. And then you've got to find a way to package that into something that is not you. Uh, so that, you know, if one person buys it or a million people buy it, it's, um, it's the same amount of effort on your part. At least that's the stuff that's interesting to me. I want to be making things and, um, and I want to find a way to make things that fills me up and also is interesting to other people. And that, that, you know, you do that, you do something that you love that other people want or need. I mean, that's, that's demand, that's supply and demand. You're going to make money doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the easiest places to get started are, you know, creating a course, creating a PDF, yeah. creating a book, something that you can create once so many times, um, you know, that's a really good place to get started. But as you were saying, you know, that's not as unique as you can get. So you got to start getting, once you get that foundation, you got to start getting upping your level in making more and more unique stuff and making better and better stuff really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, yeah. it's, it's not, Better for you, you know, like different, not better. Better means you doing what only you can do the way that only you can do it. I'm not trying to be the best writer in the world. I'm trying to be me, which is way easier than trying to be the best. It's not to say that I, I don't like, I don't want to be good, but good is subjective, right? 
um, your favorite author or artist, you know, somebody else doesn't get, they don't like it. Right. I, I, whenever I walk through an art museum, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff here that I don't get, but some people do. And there's stuff here that I love that other people are like, yeah, they walk right past it. You know, I'll stand there for 30 minutes staring at it. Your work is not for everyone. Marketing is the art of helping your work find its proper home. And then once you find those people, thousand true fans or however you want to think of it, um, your job is to now do your best work for those people. That's it. Mm. No, I totally agree with that. And then, you know, it's very subjective, a lot of it, um, as you were saying. But uh, if you could, is there any indicators that you use to spot good and bad content that you produce or writing, good or bad writing or good or bad books? You've got to be able to, I suppose, check in with yourself as well and be like, hey, this really wasn't you know, up to par or hey, this is really, really good. Is there anything you look for when you're releasing new books or new blog posts or uh, new courses, any any indicators that you're like, yep, that that improved or that was really good or that was really bad? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's um, it's nice to make something that you like. You go, oh, I really like this. This is really fun. And sometimes that's enough. But I mean, I'm not like writing a diary here. Like I'm trying to like books require readers. I'm not just doing this for myself. Um, now, I always start writing something for myself. It's like, I'm doing this because I I'm curious about this thing and I'm trying to figure it out or whatever. Um, you know, the act of writing for me is is a fun one, and so as long as I'm doing that, I'm feeling pretty good about about my choices in life. Um, but I like it when people like it, and it's a good question because I've chased lots of different metrics, thinking, well, I need money, so money's the metric. But uh, I've noticed that whether um, you know, uh, certain money is, is a means for me. It's not a master, meaning I'm making money so that I can keep doing the work, right? Walt Disney said, I don't make movies for the money. I make money so I can keep making movies, right? So it's, it's a, it's a fuel. So I, I do, I do care about money because it keeps me doing this thing. I don't have to like work at subway or something. Um, and that's cool. I mean, I probably think that'd be fine too, but, um, I love sandwiches. <clears throat> no, um, I thought it was maybe attention. I was like, oh, I need a million subscribers. That'll be fun. Uh, or, you know, every book needs to outsell the last book. I And that's those are all fine metrics. I'm not opposed to those things. I don't not care about them, but they're not the most important thing. I have noticed emotionally that the most important thing for me is when I meet somebody in person or on the internet, but face to face, and they said, I read this specific thing in one of your books, and here's what I did as a result. I don't like when people say it changed my life because I think that's BS. I'm like, change which part of your life? It's stupid. It's a bad compliment. It's like, oh, it changed my life. How? When somebody says, hey, I read your book. You are a writer. And as soon as I finished it, I started calling myself a writer. Well, that's cool. That's a that's a very clear takeaway. And it was a big part of my journey of identifying with, with being a writer. Um, that feels good to me. That feels like transformation. Um, and so... I, it's cool to, you know, I don't know, post something on Instagram and have something go viral. Uh, you know, that that's happened a few times, write a book that hits, you know, a few bestseller lists that, that those, those things feel fine. And they're also pretty fleeting for me when I meet a real person in real life. And they say, you did this and it affected me in this specific way. That feels awesome. Whether it's an email or a Zoom call or meeting somebody at a speaking gig and they tell me specifically, and I can tell that like, it's not just, um, you know, they're not just blowing smoke. That feels really good. And that's enough to keep me going for a long time. I only need like one or two of those every, you know, few months. And I'm like, I'm on the right track. I'm doing yeah, stuff. I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah. The, the money, the attention, those things are fine. But if I notice, you know, if I, quadruple my income. I don't quadruple my joy. If I see the impact of the work, which for me is, is very subjective, that does quadruple my joy. I go, oh, wow. Like more people are really resonating with this work that feels very honest to me and true to me. And it's also connecting with them. That's a, that's a beautiful combination. I'm doing work that I believe in and it's affecting people in a way that I had hoped for. Got it. So that that 
big positive feedback is really like one of those main success metrics yeah. that you're going after. It's like how how good is that creation equals how many people it affected in a really, really positive way that you heard from essentially. Yeah. I mean, when I used to sell courses, <clears throat> um, I, um, yeah, case studies, people that actually did the work and saw like, if I, if I would l talk about you on a webinar or list you on a, uh, landing page as a testimonial, mm -hmm. that was good. You know, success stories were really, uh, mm. important to me. Yeah. Yeah. And customer feedback or might not even be customer, but maybe even follower feedback yeah. or fan feedback, that sort of stuff is definitely, uh, you know, not enough people put enough emphasis on it. Um, you know, Ma I think they do get stuck in the visits per day, dollars per, per, per course or per launch or per, per day or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's lonely. Mm. It's lonely to look at a spreadsheet and go, oh, I'm successful. It's lonely to look at a bank account and go, oh, I, I'm, I'm rich, you know. Um, uh, most of the work that we do is lonely in nature. Doing it by yourself, you know, in a in a dark room, you're editing a video or, mm. you know, reworking a sentence. And so to have other people go, no, no, that was good. I like that. It's like, oh, mm. I'm, not, I'm not alone in this. You know? Yeah, yeah. I don't not want, crazy. I don't want to be alone in this. I want to, I want to, I want people to go, yeah, yeah, this is for me. I like it. Oh, that feels good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Anyway, Jeff, it's been amazing having you. Um, I think you've shared so much here. It's going to be really, really helpful for a lot of those uh, artists and creators out there trying to find their way, trying to turn their passion into, into their, uh, their full-time gig, which I think we want to see more and more people doing. But in terms of where they can find more about you, whether what you're up to, what you do, more information about you, where can where can they go? Yeah, I mean, if you like this sort of thing, um, check out my podcast called Hey Creator. You go to heycreator.com. That's H-E-Y. Not not like Hey Creator for like, you know, horses where they're like eating, hay, I don't know. <laughs> heycreator.com. You, you're smart. You can figure it out. Yeah, we'll link to all that as well. Um, and then big question, are you still running that same same blog that you originally started? I am. Yeah, yeah. It's a, Damn. It, yeah so yeah. consistency, everybody. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's changed. It's taken on a bunch of different iterations. Um if you if mm. you if you go to heycreator.com, it, it redirects to my blog where I have a weekly newsletter and a weekly podcast where we talk about, you know, creativity, nice work, business, all those things. Nice. So guys, if you need a hand uh, sorting out both creativity and business, head over there. And again, if you enjoyed this podcast episode, let us know. If you didn't, also let us know. <laughs> we love hearing from you guys, getting feedback. Um, don't forget to subscribe and everything. But Jeff, so nice having you on the uh, podcast and it's been an absolute pleasure learning from you. So really appreciate the time. Thank you, Jack. Hey guys, we put a bunch of effort into making great content for this YouTube channel. So please hit subscribe, uh, leave us a comment, hit like, and tell a few friends about it.